This is Ian Bodford. And Liang Liu. And welcome back to the Clinical Correlation. Today's case is... This is a 35-year-old female who is the front seat passenger in an MVC. She tells you that she is 31 weeks pregnant. She was wearing a seatbelt and thinks that the car was going about 50 miles per hour when the car hit a concrete barrier. The airbags did not go off. EMS reports that there was moderate intrusion on the front side of the vehicle. She was not ambulatory at the scene. She refused to be put on a backboard because of her back pain and abdominal pain. Her vital signs are unremarkable. On exam, you note that she is lying on her left side. She complains of abdominal pain when you roll her onto her back. Palpation of the abdomen reveals a firm uterus. She denies feeling any rush of fluid. Pelvic exam is negative for fluid or blood. Her fast exam does not show any free fluid in the abdomen. Transabdominal ultrasound of the fetus reveals a fetal heart rate of 109 and lack of fetal movement. OB-GYN is paged to the bedside. Trauma in the pregnant patient is the most common cause of non-obstetrical death in pregnancy. The three most common traumatic injuries are MVCs, falls, and penetrating traumatic injuries. Diagnosis and management of the injured gravid patient follows the same general traumatic algorithm as in the non-pregnant patient. However, there are many important anatomic and physiologic changes that occur with pregnancy. These must be kept in mind while evaluating and resuscitating a pregnant patient. Cardiac output increases up to 1 to 1.5 liters per minute during pregnancy. The gravid uterus in late pregnancy can compress the inferior vena cava while the patient is laying supine. This decreases preload and can dramatically decrease cardiac output. Prevent this by placing the patient in the left lateral decubitus position. Heart rate increases by as much as 15 to 20 beats above baseline in the third trimester. Both systolic and diastolic blood pressures fall by about 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury during the second trimester. The volume of blood expands by almost 50% at the end of pregnancy. However, red blood cell mass does not increase at the same rate. This will look like a dilutional anemia on lab work. A moderate leukocytosis is not uncommon later in pregnancy. Many of the coagulation factors are increased, but bleeding time, PT, PTT, and INR are unaffected. Tidal volume increases by 40% and residual volume decreases by 25% with no changes in respiratory rate. There is decreased gastric motility and gastric emptying time. Both of these predispose the patient to aspiration during intubation. The gravid uterus displaces the abdominal contents in the cephalad direction. This has a protective effect when it comes to blunt abdominal trauma, but predisposes the intestines to injury and penetrating upper abdominal injuries. Fetal survival depends completely on maternal integrity. Thus, maternal stabilization is of utmost importance. If the mother is in shock, fetal mortality approaches 80%. Resuscitation is best accomplished by restoring the circulating blood volume. Vasopressors decrease the blood flow to the uterus, but no drug should be withheld if it will save the life of the mother. The pregnant patient can be subjected to any of the normal traumatic injuries. We will focus on those injuries and complications that are specific to the pregnant patients. Uterine rupture is an extremely rare event, affecting less than 1% of pregnant trauma patients. Prior to the 12th week of pregnancy, the uterus is protected by the bony pelvis. After this, it is intra-abdominal and more vulnerable to being injured. Rupture occurs as a result of direct and intense impact. Abrupt deceleration pushes the uterus against the abdominal wall, causing it to flatten and elongate. This can increase intrauterine pressure enough to cause rupture. On exam, look for asymmetry of the uterus, signs of peritonitis, shock, difficulty palpating the uterus, and ultrasound findings showing the fetus outside the uterus. Abruptio placenta occurs as the placenta separates prematurely from the uterus. It is the most common cause of fetal death from trauma. Patients can present with vaginal bleeding, pain in the abdomen, irritability of the uterus, and uterine contractions. It complicates 1-5% to of minor traumatic cases and up to 50% of major traumatic events. The mechanism is the stretching of the elastic uterus next to the inelastic placenta. This causes a shearing of the placenta away from the uterine wall. In addition to the placental bleeding, thromboplastic materials are released into the maternal circulation. This can lead to the development of DIC. Make sure to check fibrinogen, PT, PTT, and platelet count in these patients. Fetal maternal hemorrhage occurs normally during delivery, but can also occur after a trauma in a pregnant patient. The most important consequence of fetal maternal hemorrhage is isoimmunization. This is the development of maternal antibodies against the Rh antigen of the Rh positive fetal cells. These antibodies can cross a placenta and cause fetal red cell hemolysis in future pregnancies as well as the current pregnancy. If fetal maternal hemorrhage is suspected, the mother should be given Rogam. Consultation with an obstetrician is warranted to help with dosing. The worst case scenario is cardiac arrest in a pregnant patient. As emergency physicians, we must be prepared to perform a perimortem C-section. 
The procedure must be considered in any woman after 24 weeks gestation who suffers cardiac arrest and is not responding to brief resuscitation. It is an emotional and complicated procedure, but potentially it can improve outcomes for both mother and infant. Many factors go into the decision to perform it. The fetus must be a viable age. If gestational age is less than 36 weeks, the hospital needs a neonatal ICU. If not available at your hospital, one must be nearby in order to perform the procedure. Initiate CPR as soon as maternal arrest is noted, and designate a team to continue resuscitation of the mother. Make sure to place a wedge under the patient's right side to help with blood return to the heart. The decision to begin the perimortem C-section needs to be made within 4 minutes of the arrest and should be completed within 5 minutes of the rest. Do not waste time sterilizing the field. A scalpel should be used to cut through the abdominal wall. The incision goes from the pubic symphysis to the umbilicus. Bring the bladder inferiorly and decompress it if necessary. Make a 5 cm incision in the uterus until amniotic fluid is seen and use your fingers to lift the uterus away from the fetus. Use scissors to extend the incision. Deliver the infant. Clamp and cut the cord and resuscitate if necessary. To summarize, trauma resuscitation is not any different in pregnant patients. Follow the ATLS pathway. Resuscitate the mother as this is the best way to ensure survival of the fetus as well. Remember the anatomic and physiologic changes in pregnancy. And know how to perform a perimortem C-section and be prepared to do it when the time comes. So that's it for this case. Send us your comments, suggestions, and cases to the clinical correlation at gmail.com and follow me on Twitter at MD Notified. And me at EMLU. Thanks for listening.